Thanks very much for the organisers for the invitation. Um, as Michael alluded to, I'm going to talk about the Met and Sepsis. Um, so these are my conflicts of interest. I'm uh, an advisor for a healthcare service, which is a paid, um, uh, not very much as you can see, a voluntary advisor for the commission. And I've received an unrestricted education grant from Edwards, but I don't receive any royalties or payments or assistance for travel or accommodation for any of the um, content that I'm about to talk about. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the epidemiology of sepsis, things that might worsen outcome, delayed interventions, three studies that we've done at the Austin Hospital, looking specifically at the role of the medical emergency team in sepsis. Um, talk about a pilot study we've done in 50 patients with non-invasive measurement of cardiac output during met calls, and then conceptually how the medical emergency team might improve outcomes from sepsis. Um, Professor Dean's just talked extensively about pneumonia in, in, in the emergency department. I think there's a lot of information from Australia, New Zealand and America about the epidemiology of sepsis in the emergency department. There's much less on the epidemiology of patients developing sepsis on the ward. We had a simple um, point prevalence study which suggested that 23% of patients on a single day have evidence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, and about 7% of them overall had evidence of sepsis on any given day. Um, we know uh, that particularly if patients are hypotensive or shocked, that delayed commencement of appropriate antibiotics is probably important. And I think protracted hypotension in at least observational studies is being shown to worsen outcome, and it may be that um, the commencement of early vasopressor therapy is potentially beneficial. And I know there's a number of groups around the world that are planning to do randomised control trials to address that specific question. I guess this is a background to what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of my talk. So given that rapid response systems are not particularly well known in this uh, part of the world, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about them. Um, they are specialised teams that review deteriorating patients, particularly on the ward, but depending where you are in the world, even in the emergency department and sometimes the intensive care unit, they're activated when a patient fulfils um, predefined, mostly physiological criteria, um, and then the team responds, and that team's varying in its composition and expertise, and they're also overseen by administrative and, and um, quality improvement limbs. Um, as I mentioned, they have calling criteria. These are the calling criteria from the Austin Hospital, um, and they're based on, sorry, I'm just trying to find a laser pointer, maybe? No. Um, they're based on um, airway breathing and circulation, uh, and they're variables that were chosen relatively um, ad hoc based on what clinicians initially thought were important uh, that they would want to know about for a patient who was on the ward receiving one to four or one to eight nursing ratios, depending on the time of day. Um, uh, this is what a, a cardiac arrest team looks like. This is what a medical emergency team looks like. This is a real photo of a real call where we were um, planning roles and goals with um, uh, looking at individual roles during a MET call. They tend to be much more calm, much more uh, um, considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so how common then is sepsis during MET calls? And I'm just going to go through three admittedly single centre studies, but there's not that much information on this. The first study was just a, a retrospective study where we simply looked at what the registrar or the fellow thought was the cause of the deterioration. And then when we looked at the criteria amongst those 400 calls, some patients had more than one criteria approximately a quarter of all of the criteria were thought to be attributed to sepsis. And this is just the summary from the, um, the article that um, presents this. And you can see that sepsis, pneumonia and aspiration, sepsis, sepsis, comes up very high on the differential diagnosis list of what the registrar thought was wrong at the time. Now this is just uh, a free text. It didn't have any specific diagnostic criteria. So then we went on, this is when SERVS was still popular, uh, looking at a retrospective study over three months in 2011 to look to see whether the patient had SERVS criteria in the 24 hours before and the 12 hours after the call, and whether they had evidence of, uh, objective evidence of, of sepsis, and they were the four criteria that were used. Um, 
interesting when you look at SERS criteria compared to the triggering criteria for rapid response systems, the, res the uh, respiratory rate and heart rate criteria are both above the SERS criteria um, in, our in our particular hospital, and our hospital are relatively soft in our criteria. Some hospitals have quite e um, more extreme criteria. Um, not surprisingly, we found that uh, of all these patients, three quarters actually fulfilled SERS criteria, and that sepsis was thought to be present in half of the patients, um, and roughly equally distributed into community-acquired and hospital-acquired infections. Um, when you looked at um, uh, which patients had evidence of sepsis, it was roughly 44% of all the, <coughs> excuse me, the patients. And if you excluded all other causes of sepsis, of SERS rather, that might have been present, such as post-operative um, uh, fever or uh, medication side effect or pain, sepsis was thought to be the only cause of the SERS criteria in about a quarter of the cases. And um, as Professor Dean alluded to, the most common source was the respiratory tract, uh, which outnumbered the next category by a factor of about two to one. And as I alluded to, they're roughly half and half hospital and community acquired. Um, uh, quite um, satisfyingly, patients were on therapeutic antibiotics in 80% of the cases where the patient was thought to be septic. This is the septic met calls. Um, but interestingly, it was modified in almost half, or antibiotics were added in almost half after the review. And the patients who had septic met calls um, stayed considerably longer than those who did not have a septic met call. So then on to QSOFA. Um, the good part about new diagnostic criteria is it gives you a new opportunity to do another single centre observational study. This now we did prospectively and we did it over one month. You can see that the number of MET calls we have is now significantly greater than in 2011. And we got the worst vital signs in the six hours before and during the MET call. And we asked the registrar, do you think the patient had an infection? And what was the source? And then we looked at whether the patient was on antibiotics before and after. And this data is not yet complete. Um, but we also assessed whether they um, obtained a lactate uh, and whether they required ICU therapy in the hospital outcomes. We looked at QSOFA criteria, whether they had two or more of the following, and we found that about 40% of the patients with MET criteria fulfilled QSOFA criteria. They had worse respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure and GCS. They were more likely to be admitted to ICU, get vasoactive agents, and they were more likely to have vasoactive agents and less likely to be alive at hospital discharge. Um, it was a, quite a substantial difference, both clinically and statistically. Uh, and presumed infection was again present in about half of the patients, and we're yet to look at the interaction between QSOFA and, and sepsis, which will be interesting, I think. Um, just very quickly, we've um, managed, uh, as part of an unrestricted educational grant from um, Edwards Life Sciences, to measure the um, non-invasive cardiac output of, uh, for, of 50 uh, non-consecutive MET calls, we were able to get a signal in 47 of the patients. If, just so you know about the technology, it's basically very similar to a saturation probe that goes around the finger, um, but it inflates about a thousand times a second, which I just find extraordinary, and um, develops a pulse contour analysis which gives you continuous bl blood pressure. It estimates stroke volume, and from that you can get cardiac output. It's actually been somewhat validated compared to other more invasive techniques. Um, and it obviously have, has the advantage of a very short startup time. We found in the patients, um, amongst the patients, that the um, mean, uh, sorry, the median cardiac output was 5.9 litres and the me median cardiac index is three and a half litres. When you break them down into low, normal or high cardiac output, the vast majority of patients um, in these 50 MET calls had either a normal or a high cardiac output, perhaps consistent with the, the predominance of sepsis that's uh, in the patient group. So then how could the medical emergency team potentially improve outcomes of patients with sepsis? Well, the medical emergency team's aim is to identify deteriorating patients via the afferent limb and to provide expert responders through the efferent limb and this efferent limb is often intensive care based. And theoretically, 
they can triage the patient and consider whether they're appropriate for intensive care admission. So the MET might improve outcomes via better detection, a more senior response, and more rapid admission to intensive care at commencement of vasopressotherapy. Um, interestingly, uh, a Swedish study, single centre study over a three year period, looked at whether patients were admitted via a rapid response team or not. Uh, and they found that patients that were admitted via a rapid response team were older, had more comorbidity, and were three times more likely to, be, to have an admission diagnosis of severe sepsis, suggesting that the MET is having an important role in the detection of these patients. Whether it's early or not, or earlier or not, is an is a unknown question. Uh, an American group led by um, Professor uh, Babak looked at in implementation of an antibiotic algorithm amongst their um, rapid response team patients and found improvement in the administration of appropriate antibiotics, but it was very underpowered and small to detect any differences in outcome. Uh, I'll just skip through these two slides. This is from a summary looking at governance um, of how the, um, we might improve recognition and response of, um, to septic patients in hospitals. But I guess if you think about um, factors we know that are important in the, in the uh, improving outcomes of sepsis, we really need to look at system factors, particularly in hospitalised patients. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to do two things at once. On how we can rapidly detect the clinical features of sepsis, staff should be educated to recognise sepsis and organ dysfunction. Um, care should be escalated reliably. And when care is transferred or, or handed over, it should be structured. And whatever the evidence base is of the time, we should improve compliance with that. And there should be a timely transfer of intensive care. So I guess this is looking at the management of sepsis from a global perspective, not on an individual patient, on how we can improve system factors to reduce delays in what we already know are important variables in the management of sepsis. And we talked about that in this uh, review in um, current infectious disease and respiratory reviews last year, and how really hospitals should contemplate having an overarching governance and policies and procedures and have continuous audit and quality improvement within their hospital to look at these factors of detection, recognition, the initial response and appropriate escalation when patients are either complex or failing to respond or developing organ dysfunction. And there should be, in amongst all of that, education and training of the staff, which in particular with the medical staff turn over every year. So in summary, MET criteria provide objective criteria for clinical deterioration. And many of the MET criteria certainly are consistent with QSOFA and SERS criteria and seem to detect patients with, um, uh, who have sepsis. Uh, responders in the medical emergency team are often from the intensive care unit and it seems increasingly that infection is a common cause of MET deterioration. Um, from at least this single centre study, QSO for patients seem to have a much worse outcome and the MET may provide an opportunity to improve the recognition and response to ward patients and I would advocate there needs to be a whole hospital response, particularly in patients who are on the ward who are having intermittent vital signs taken to improve the recognition and response of sepsis, um, and particularly their triage and transfer to critical care when it's needed. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say that there's a Chicago meeting in May and a, a Sydney meeting in August, um, and to promote the um, October ANZICS meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daryl. Have we got uh, any questions from Mervyn? Oh, we've got, oh no, we've got uh, David uh, first. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> David Ernest from Melbourne, Australia. Thanks, Daryl, for your presentation. You made a couple of references to antibiotic modifications in response to the r rapid response team's arrival, uh, and you, you had some 50% change in your own single centre study. I'm interested to hear, and you may not have the answer, how much was that because as doctors we feel obliged to do something as we do in intensive care all the time versus how much it actually made a difference that you actually had cultures and you said, yes, you're on the wrong antibiotic, now you're on the right one. Yeah, I, I, that's not possible to ascertain from the data we have, David, but I, I get the impression that a lot of the patients are either not responding to the initial therapy they had or that they were actually had a hospital acquired rather than or developed hospital-acquired rather than community-acquired infection. 
No, thank you very much. Uh, my thought, uh, question was on actually very similar lines because um, there's a, a feeling that you have to offer something. And one of the interesting things, like emergency room studies, there are some intensive care studies recently where um, the emergency room ones, on average, 20, 25% of people treated for sepsis turn out to have something else. Yep. And uh, there's a lovely study from Holland where uh, uh, just over 50% of patients were subsequently adjudicated. And uh, sorry, of all patients admitted with a diagnosis of sepsis, only just over half were subsequently adjudicated as definite or Absolutely. probable. Yep. So, uh, again, one of it's which is a follow up on David's question is uh, is there that follow up to say, well, well, I know it's not the duty of the MET team, but I think yep. it's a really crucial point that we feel we're offering something, but does it make a difference? Yep. I, I don't know if you've got a thought or comment. Well, I, I guess the, the MET has come to provide a second opinion as to what they think is wrong with the patient at the time. Um, I think the fact that a very large proportion of the patients require subsequent ICU admission, commencement of vasoactive therapy and mechanical ventilation, I think lends support to the fact that they certainly had a, a shock diagnosis, whether it was septic. The fact that their high cardiac output in a significant proportion of um, METs that we looked at, the 50 METs, suggests that it's probably not a low output state cardiogenic, so it's certainly some sort of inflammatory distributive vasodilatory state. Now, whether that's sepsis or not, I think is, is extremely difficult. As you've alluded to, there's no gold standard for the, the diagnosis of sepsis, and it's largely a clinical diagnosis. Got that. Professor yeah. Dean has a question. Yes, interesting uh, presentation, Daryl. Uh, from what I understood, it appears that you have a structured uh, approach to uh, diagnosis and then initiation of treatment. And I was wondering if that is a paper diagram flow sheet or you have something electronic for handheld phones or how do you actually teach and, and implement that? So at the moment, it's just on the basis of education of our, of our registrars or fellows. Um, but increasingly, I think we have to have, because we've now got electronic prescribing, and we, we can potentially have care sets and, and, um, and uh, a pathway or a sepsis algorithm, whatever you want to call it, um, whereby um, the various elements of whatever we consider the evidence-based therapy to be given uh, as an electronic decision support tool. So it'll probably be electronic in the future. At the moment, it's just paper-based. Okay, thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Daryl, for that excellent uh, presentation.